The Raven Boys by Maggie Stiefvater. Prologue. Blue Sargent had forgotten how many times she'd been told that she would kill her true love. Her family traded in predictions. These predictions tended, however, to run toward the nonspecific. Things like, something terrible will happen to you today. It might involve the number six. Or, money is coming. Open your hand for it. Or, you have a big decision, and it will not make itself. The people who came to the little, bright blue house at 300 Fox Way didn't mind the imprecise nature of their fortunes. It became a game, a challenge, to realize the exact moment that the predictions came true. When a van carrying six people wheeled into a client's car two hours after his psychic reading, he could nod with a sense of accomplishment and release. When a neighbor offered to buy another client's old lawnmower if she was looking for a bit of extra cash, she could recall the promise of money coming and sell it with the sense that the transaction had been foretold. Or, when a third client heard his wife say, This is a decision that has to be made, he could remember the same words being said by Maura Sargent over a spread of tarot cards, and then leap decisively to action. But the imprecise nature of the fortunes stole some of their power. The predictions could be dismissed as coincidences, hunches. They were a chuckle in the Walmart parking lot when you ran into an old friend as promised. A shiver when the number 17 appeared on an electric bill. A realization that even if you had discovered the future, it really didn't change how you lived in the present. They were truth, but they weren't all of the truth. I should tell you, Mora always advised her new clients, that this reading will be accurate, but not specific. It was easier that way, but this was not what Blue was told. Again and again, she had her fingers spread wide, her palm examined, her cards plucked from velvet-edged decks and spread across the fuzz of a family friend's living room carpet. Thumbs were pressed to the mystical, invisible third eye that was said to lie between everyone's eyebrows. Runes were cast and dreams interpreted, tea leaves scrutinized and seances conducted. All the women came to the same conclusion, blunt and inexplicably specific. What they all agreed on, in many different clairvoyant languages, was this. If Blue was to kiss her true love, he would die. For a long time this bothered Blue. The warning was specific, certainly, but in the way of a fairy tale. It didn't say how her true love would die. It didn't say how long after the kiss he would survive. Did it have to be a kiss on the lips? Would a chaste peck on the back of his palm prove as deadly? Until she was eleven, Blue was convinced she would silently contract an infectious disease. One press of her lips to her hypothetical soulmate, and he, too, would die in a consumptive battle untreatable by modern medicine. When she was thirteen, Blue decided that jealousy would kill him instead. An old boyfriend emerging at the moment of that first kiss, bearing a handgun and a heart full of hurt. When she turned fifteen, Blue concluded that her mother's tarot cards were just a pack of playing cards, and that the dreams of her mother and the other clairvoyant women were fueled by mixed drinks rather than otherworldly insight. And so the prediction didn't matter. She knew better, though. The predictions that came out of 300 Fox Way were unspecific, but undeniably true. Her mother had dreamt Blue's broken wrist on the first day of school. Her Aunt Jimmy predicted Mora's tax return to within $10. Her older cousin Orla always began to hum her favorite song a few minutes before it came on the radio. No one in the house ever really doubted that Blue was destined to kill her true love with a kiss. It was a threat, however, that had been around for so long that it had lost its force. Picturing six-year-old Blue in love was such a far-off thing as to be imaginary. And by sixteen, Blue had decided she would never fall in love, so it didn't matter. But that belief changed when her mother's half-sister Neve came to their little town of Henrietta. Neve had gotten famous for doing loudly what Blue's mother did quietly. Mora's readings were done in her front room, mostly for residents of Henrietta and the valley around it. Neve, on the other hand, did her readings on television at five o'clock in the morning. She had a website featuring old soft-focus photographs of her staring unerringly at the viewer. Four books on the supernatural bore her name on the cover. Blue had never met Neve, so she knew more about her half-aunt from a cursory web search than from personal experience. Blue wasn't sure why Neve was coming to visit, but she knew her imminent arrival spurred a legion of whispered conversations between Mora and her two best friends, Persephone and Calla. The sort of conversations that trailed off into sipping coffee and tapping pens on the table when Blue entered the room. But Blue wasn't particularly concerned about Neve's arrival. 
What was one more woman in a house filled to the brim with them? Neve finally appeared on a spring evening, when the already long shadows of the mountains to the west seemed even longer than usual. When Blue opened the door for her, she thought for a moment that Neve was an unfamiliar old woman, but then her eyes grew used to the stretched crimson light coming through the trees, and she saw that Neve was barely older than her mother, which was not very old at all. Outside, in the distance, hounds were crying. Blue was familiar enough with their voices. Each fall, the Aglianby Hunt Club rode out with horses and foxhounds nearly every weekend. Blue knew what their frantic howls meant at that moment. They were on the chase. You're Maura's daughter, Neve said, and before Blue could answer, she added, This is the year you'll fall in love. Chapter 1 It was freezing in the churchyard, even before the dead arrived. Every year, Blue and her mother Maura had come to the same place, and every year it was chilly. But this year, without Maura here with her, it felt colder. It was April 24th, St. Mark's Eve. For most people, St. Mark's Day came and went without note. It wasn't a school holiday. No presents were exchanged. There were no costumes or festivals. There were no St. Mark's Day sales. No St. Mark's Day cards in the store racks. No special television programs that aired only once a year. No one marked April 25th on their calendar. In fact, most of the living were unaware that St. Mark even had a day named in his honor. But the dead remembered. As Blue sat shivering on the stone wall, she reasoned that at least, at the very least, it wasn't raining this year. Every St. Mark's Eve, this was where Mora and Blue drove. An isolated church so old that its name had been forgotten. The ruin was cupped in the densely wooded hills outside of Henrietta, still several miles from the mountains proper. Only the exterior walls remained. The roof and floors had long ago collapsed inside. What hadn't rotted away was hidden under hungry vines and rancid-smelling saplings. The church was surrounded by a stone wall, broken only by a lich gate just large enough for a coffin and its bearers. A stubborn path that seemed impervious to weeds led through to the old church door. Ah, hissed Neve, plump but strangely elegant, as she sat beside Blue on the wall. Blue was struck again, as she had been struck the first time she'd met Neve, by her oddly lovely hands. Chubby wrists led to soft, childlike palms, and slender fingers with oval nails. Ah, uh, Neve murmured again, Tonight is a night. She said it like this, Tonight is a night, and when she did, Blue felt her skin creep a little. Blue had sat watch with her mother for the past ten St. Mark's Eves, but tonight felt different. Tonight was a night. This year, for the first time, and for reasons Blue didn't understand, Maura sent Neve to do the church watch in her place. Her mother had asked Blue if she would go along as usual, but it wasn't really a question. Blue had always gone. She would go this time. It was not as if she had made plans for St. Mark's Eve, but she had to be asked. Maura had decided sometime before Blue's birth that it was barbaric to order children about, and so Blue had grown up surrounded by imperative question marks. Blue opened and closed her chilly fists. The top edges of her fingerless gloves were fraying. She'd done a bad job knitting them last year, but they had a certain trashy chic to them. If she hadn't been so vain, Blue could have worn the boring but functional gloves she'd been given for Christmas. But she was vain. So instead, she had her fraying fingerless gloves, infinitely cooler, though also colder, and no one to see them but Neve and the dead. April days in Henrietta were quite often fair, tender things, coaxing sleeping trees to bud and love-mad ladybugs to beat against window panes. But not tonight. It felt like winter. Blue glanced at her watch. A few minutes until eleven. The old legends recommended the church watch be kept at midnight, but the dead kept poor time, especially when there wasn't a moon. Unlike Blue, who didn't tend toward patience, Neve was a regal statue on the old church wall, hands folded, ankles crossed beneath a long wool skirt. Blue, huddled, shorter and thinner, was a restless, sightless gargoyle. It wasn't a night for her ordinary eyes. It was a night for seers and psychics, witches and mediums. In other words, the rest of her family. Out of the silence, Neve asked, Do you hear anything? Her eyes glittered in the black. No, Blue answered, because she didn't. Then she wondered if Neve had asked, because Neve did. Neve was looking at her with the same gaze that she wore in all of her photos on the website. The deliberately unnerving, otherworldly stare 
that lasted several more seconds than was comfortable. A few days after Neve had arrived, Blue had been distressed enough to mention it to Mora. They had both been crammed into the single bathroom, Blue getting ready for school, Mora for work, Blue, trying to clip all of the various bits of her dark hair back into a vestigial ponytail, had asked, Does she have to stare like that? In the shower, her mother drew patterns in the steamed glass door. She had paused to laugh, a flash of her skin visible through the long, intersecting lines she had drawn. Oh, that's just Neve's trademark. Blue thought there were probably better things to be known for. In the churchyard, Neve said enigmatically. There is a lot to hear. The thing was, there wasn't. In the summer, the foothills were alive with insects buzzing, mockingbirds whistling back and forth, ravens yelling at cars. But it was too cool tonight for anything to be awake yet. I don't hear things like that, Blue said. A little surprised Neve wasn't already aware. In Blue's intensely clairvoyant family, she was a fluke, an outsider to the vibrant conversation her mother and aunts and cousins held with a world hidden to most people. The only thing that was special about her was something that she herself couldn't experience. I hear as much of the conversation as the telephone. I just make things louder for everyone else. Neve still hadn't looked away. So that's why Mora was so eager for you to come along. Does she have you at all her readings as well? Blue shuddered at the thought. A fair number of the clients who entered 300 Fox Way were miserable women hoping Mora would see love and money in their future. The idea of being trapped in the house with that all day was excruciating. Blue knew it had to be very tempting for her mother to have Blue present, making her psychic powers stronger. When she was younger, she'd never appreciated how little Mora called on her to join in a reading. But now that Blue understood how well she honed other people's talents, she was impressed at Mora's restraint. Not unless it's a very important one, she replied. Neve's gaze had edged over the subtle line between discomforting and creepy. She said, It's something to be proud of, you know. To make someone else's psychic gift stronger is a rare and valuable thing. Oh, pshaw, Blue said, but not cruelly. She meant to be funny. She'd had sixteen years to get used to the idea that she wasn't privy to the supernatural. She didn't want Neve to think she was experiencing an identity crisis over it. She tugged a string on her glove. And you have plenty of time to grow into your own intuitive talents, Neve added. Her gaze seemed hungry. Blue didn't reply. She wasn't interested in telling other people's futures. She was interested in going out and finding her own. Neve finally dropped her eyes. Tracing an idle finger through the dirt on the stones between them, she said, I passed by a school on the way into town, Aglionby Academy. Is that where you go? Blue's eyes widened with humor. But of course Neve, an outsider, couldn't know. Still surely she could have guessed from the massive stone Great Hall and the parking lot full of cars that spoke German that it wasn't the sort of school that they could afford. It's an all-boys school, for politicians' sons and oil barons' sons, and for... Blue struggled to think of who else might be rich enough to send their kids to Aglionby. The sons of mistresses living off hush money. Neve raised an eyebrow without looking up. No, really. They're awful, Blue said. April was a bad time for the Aglionby boys. As it warmed up, the convertibles appeared, bearing boys in shorts so tacky that only the rich would dare to wear them. During the school week, they all wore the Aglionby uniform, khaki pants and a v-neck sweater with a raven emblem. It was an easy way to identify the advancing army. Raven boys. Blue continued. They think they're better than us, and that we're all falling all over ourselves for them, and they drink themselves senseless every weekend and spray-paint the Henrietta exit sign. Aglionby Academy was the number one reason Blue had developed her two rules. One, stay away from boys, because they were trouble. And two, stay away from Aglionby boys, because they were bastards. You seem like a very sensible teen, Neve said, which annoyed Blue, because she already knew she was a very sensible teen. When you had as little money as the sergeants did, sensibility in all matters was ingrained young. In the ambient light from the nearly full moon, Blue caught sight of what Neve had drawn in the dirt. She asked, What is that? Mom drew that. Did she? Neve asked. They studied the pattern. It was three curving, intersecting lines, making a long sort of triangle. Did she say what it was? She was drawing it on the shower door. I didn't ask. I dreamt it. Neve said, 
in a flat voice that sent an unpleasant shudder along the back of Blue's neck. I wanted to see what it looked like drawn out. She rubbed her palm through the pattern, then abruptly held up a beautiful hand. She said, I think they're coming. This was why Blue and Neve were here. Every year Mora sat on the wall, knees pulled up to her chin, staring at nothing, and recited names to Blue. To Blue, the churchyard remained empty, but to Mora, it was full of the dead. Not the currently dead, but the spirits of those who would die in the next twelve months. For Blue, it had always been like hearing one half of a conversation. Sometimes her mother would recognize the spirits, but often she would have to lean forward to ask them their names. Mora had once explained that if Blue wasn't there, she couldn't convince them to answer her. The dead couldn't see Mora without Blue's presence. Blue never grew tired of feeling particularly needed, but sometimes she wished needed felt less like a synonym for useful. The church watch was critical for one of Mora's most unusual services. So long as clients lived in the area, she guaranteed to let them know if they or a local loved one was bound to die in the next twelve months. Who wouldn't pay for that? Well, the true answer was, most of the world, as most people didn't believe in psychics. Can you see anything? Blue asked. She gave her numb hands a bracing rub before snatching up a notebook and pen from the wall. Neve was very still. Something just touched my hair. Again, a shiver thrilled up Blue's arms. One of them? In a husky voice, Neve said, The future dead have to follow the corpse road through the gate. This is probably another spirit called by your energy. I didn't realize what an effect you would have. Mora had never mentioned other dead people being attracted by Blue. Perhaps she hadn't wanted to scare her. Or maybe Mora just hadn't seen them. Maybe she was as blind to these other spirits as Blue was. Blue became uncomfortably aware of the slightest breeze touching her face, lifting Neve's curly hair. Invisible, orderly spirits of not yet truly dead people were one thing. Ghosts that weren't compelled to stay on the path were another. Are they? Blue started. Who are you? Robert Neumann. Neve interrupted. What's your name? Ruth Vert. What's your name? Francis Powell. Scratching quickly to catch up, Blue printed the names phonetically as Neve solicited them. Every so often she lifted her eyes to the path, trying to glimpse... something. But as always, there was only the overgrown crabgrass, the barely visible oak trees, the black mouth of the church accepting invisible spirits, nothing to hear, nothing to see, no evidence of the dead except for their names written in the notebook in her hand. Maybe Neve was right. Maybe Blue was having a bit of an identity crisis. Some days it did seem a little unfair that all of the wonder and power that surrounded her family was passed to Blue in the form of paperwork. At least I can still be a part of it, Blue thought grimly, although she felt about as included as a seeing eye dog. She held the notebook up to her face, close, 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 so she could read it in the darkness. It was like a roster of names popular seventy and eighty years before. Dorothy, Ralph, Clarence, Esther, Herbert, Melvin. A lot of the same last names, too. The valley was dominated by several old families that were large, if not powerful. Somewhere outside of Blue's thoughts, Neve's tone became more emphatic. What's your name? Excuse me, what is your name? Her consternated expression looked wrong on her face. Out of habit, Blue followed Neve's gaze to the center of the courtyard, and she saw someone. Blue's heart hammered like a fist to her breastbone. On the other side of the heartbeat, he was still there. Where there should have been nothing, there was a person. I see him, Blue said. Neve, I see him. Blue had always imagined the procession of spirits to be an orderly thing, but this spirit wandered, hesitant. It was a young man in slacks and a sweater, hair rumpled. He was not quite transparent, but he wasn't quite there either. His figure was as murky as dirty water, his face indistinct. There was no identifying feature to him apart from his youth. He was so young. That was the hardest part to get used to. As Blue watched, he paused and put his fingers to the side of his nose and his temple. It was such a strangely living gesture that Blue felt a little sick. Then he stumbled forward, as if jostled from behind. Get his name, I... Neve hissed. He won't answer me and I need to get the others. Me? Blue replied, but she slid off the wall. Her heart was still ramming inside her ribcage. She asked, feeling a little foolish, What's your name? He didn't seem to hear her. 
Without a twitch of acknowledgement, he began to move again, slow and bewildered, toward the church door. Is this how we make our way to death? Blue wondered. A stumbling fade-out instead of a self-aware finale? As Neve began again to call out questions to the others, Blue made her way toward the Wanderer. Who are you? She called from a safe distance, as he dropped his forehead into his hands. His form had no outline at all, she saw now, and his face was truly featureless. There was nothing about him, really, that made him human-shaped, but still, she saw a boy. There was something telling her mind what he was, even if it wasn't telling her eyes. There was no thrill in seeing him, as she had thought there would be. All she could think was, he will be dead within a year. How did Mora bear it? Blue stole closer. She was close enough to touch him as he began to walk again. But still he made no sign of seeing her. This near to him, her hands were freezing. Her heart was freezing. Invisible spirits with no warmth of their own sucked at her energy, pulling goosebumps up her arms. The young man stood on the threshold of the church, and Blue knew, just knew, that if he stepped into the church, she would lose the chance to get his name. Please, Blue said, softer than before. She reached out a hand and touched the very edge of his not-there sweater. Cold flooded through her like dread. She tried to steady herself with what she'd always been told. Spirits drew all their energy from their surroundings. All she was feeling was him using her to stay visible. But it still felt a lot like dread. She asked, Will you tell me your name? He faced her, and she realized with shock that he wore an Aglionby sweater. Gansey, he said, though his voice was quiet. It wasn't a whisper. It was a real voice, spoken from someplace almost too far away to hear. Blue couldn't stop staring at his must hair, the suggestion of staring eyes, the raven on his sweater. His shoulders were soaked, she saw, and the rest of his clothing rain-spattered from a storm that hadn't happened yet. This close, she could smell something minty that she wasn't sure was unique to him or unique to spirits. He was so real. When it finally happened, when she finally saw him, it didn't feel like magic at all. It felt like looking into the grave and seeing it look back at her. Is that all? She whispered. Gansey closed his eyes. That's all there is. He fell to his knees, a soundless gesture for a boy with no real body. One hand splayed in the dirt, fingers pressed to the ground. Blue saw the blackness of the church more clearly than the curved shape of his shoulder. Neve, Blue said. Neve, he's... dying. Neve had come to stand just behind her. She replied, Not yet. Gansey was nearly gone now, fading into the church, or the church fading into him. Blue's voice was breathier than she would have liked. Why? Why can I see him? Neve glanced over her shoulder, either because there were more spirits coming, or because there weren't. Blue couldn't tell. By the time she looked back, Gansey had vanished entirely. Already, Blue felt warmth returning to her skin, but something behind her lungs felt icy. A dangerous, sucking sadness seemed to be opening up inside her. Grief or regret. There are only two reasons a non-seer would see a spirit on St. Mark's Eve, Blue. Either you're his true love, or you killed him 